This is lecture two, review of collecting and describing data. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to construct a conceptual and operational definition of a variable, enter data into SPSS and read data in SPSS, classify a data set based on its unit of analysis, identify a variable's level of measurement, calculate and interpret the mode, median, and mean of a variable, construct and interpret a bar graph and histogram of a variable, and calculate and interpret the standard deviation of a variable. Note that this lecture is a compilation of three lectures from my Political Science 298 course. Although I am reviewing basic statistical concepts that you should be familiar with by this point, there is a lot of material. As such, I have divided the lecture into three sections so that you can go through the material slowly. You will complete sections one and two this week and complete section three next week. In the previous lecture, I briefly reviewed the basic steps in conducting the statistical analysis of political science research. Before I go into more detail how to conduct statistical research in political science, First, I need to teach you how to measure concepts and variables. If you do not know how to measure concepts and variables, you will not be able to conduct any statistical analysis. Hence, this lecture is all about collecting and measuring data. Political scientists study concepts such as liberalism and conservatism, inequality and inequality. These concepts are not tangible. You cannot touch them or hold them in your hand. You cannot see them. You cannot hear them. Nevertheless, we know these concepts exist. They exist as mental constructs. Since these concepts are mostly mental constructs, we have to make sure we have a good de definition of what they are if we want to measure them and collect data on them. For example, we may have a general idea of what war looks like. Two states may use physical force against each other. They may destroy each other's property, and there may be battle deaths. However, not all conflicts between states are wars. Sometimes two states will have a single battle in a single day and the conflict will end. Is a one-day conflict a war? Not really. So how do political scientists distinguish between wars and short-term conflicts? One way to do it is to use battle deaths as a criterion. The correlates of war data set classifies any conflict between states with a thousand or more battle deaths as a war. In this lecture, I will show you how to define concepts so they are measurable. In order to measure a concept, we need to develop a more concrete idea about what the concept means. The first step in this process is developing a conceptual definition of the concept. A conceptual definition is a concrete and well-specified definition of a variable. It tells us what we have to observe in the real world to measure our variable. A conceptual definition first includes the unit of analysis. The unit of analysis tells us who the concept applies to. Is it individuals? Is it parties? Is it countries? Or is it pairs of countries? It also tells us where they exist and when they exist. The conceptual definition also identifies a concept's measurable properties that we can observe in the real world. Here is an example of a conceptual definition for ideology. Individuals who are liberal believe that it is appropriate for the government to redistribute resources from the wealthiest citizens to the poorest citizens. Individuals who are conservative believe that it is inappropriate for the government to redistribute resources from the wealthiest citizens to the poorest citizens. Note that individuals is the unit of analysis as it tells us what the concept applies to. Individuals have ideological beliefs. Note that the following information tells us what the variable's measurable properties are. We know an individual is liberal if they believe that it is appropriate for the government to redistribute resources from the wealthiest citizens to the poorest citizens. And we know an individual is conservative if they believe that it is inappropriate for the government to redistribute resources from the wealthiest citizens to the poorest citizens. In the next slides, I will show you how to develop a conceptual definition. 
As an example, we are going to develop a conceptual definition of democracy. The first step in creating a conceptual definition of a variable is to identify the variable's unit of analysis. Recall that the unit of analysis tells us who the concept applies to, who or what they are, and when they exist. The who of a unit of analysis could include a lot of different types of individuals. It could be individuals such as survey respondents, students, candidates, legislators, or judges. The what of a unit of analysis could include a lot of different types of entities. It could be political parties, countries, or international organizations. The when of a unit of analysis tells us when the who or what existed in time. It could be days, months, years, or even centuries. Here is a unit of analysis for a level of democracy variable. Since democracy applies to countries, countries is the unit of analysis. And I indicate what year I am examining those countries in, 2017. The next step in developing a conceptual definition is identifying the concept's measurable properties. These are properties that we can observe in the real world. For example, if we are writing a conceptual definition of democracy, the measurable properties of democracy can include whether a country has elections, whether leaders of a country are held accountable for their actions, and whether the country has a highly developed economy. Those are all potential properties of democracy that we can actually observe in the real world. After we identify the concept's measurable properties, we have to modify our list just to make sure that we are only including relevant and measurable criteria in the list. For example, in our previous list, elections and accountability were good measurable properties because all democracies should have elections with elected officials who are held accountable for their actions. However, we should leave out the economic development property. Economic development is not an inherent property of democracy. As long as a country has elections and leaders are held accountable for their actions, it is a democracy. Its economy does not need to be developed. A country could be a poor democracy. After we modify our list of measurable properties, we write down our conceptual definition. You can use the following template to write down a conceptual definition. The concept of X is defined as the extent to which subjects exhib exhibit the characteristic of Z. So using our democracy example, we would write, the concept of democracy is defined as the extent to which an individual country holds regular elections and holds leaders accountable for their actions. Democracy is our concept. An individual country in 2017 is the unit of analysis and holds elections and holds leaders accountable for their actions is the measurable properties. Next we will discuss how to develop an operational de definition. Recall that an operational definition tells us specifically how the concept is measured. The operational definition includes the unit of analysis, the values the variable takes, what those values mean, what we have to observe in the real world to determine the value each observation takes, and the source of the data. Here is an example of an operational definition for an ideology variable. The unit of analysis is the individual in 2016. The values the variable takes are 0 or 1. A 0 means liberal and a 1 means conservative. The specific criteria for coding it is as follows. A person who says they believe that it is, a, it is appropriate for the government to redistribute resources from the wealthy citizens to the poor citizens is coded as liberal. A person who says they believe that it is not appropriate for the government to redistribute resources from the wealthy citizens to the poor citizens, citizens is coded as conservative. And the source of the data is the American National Election Survey. The first step in writing an operational definition of a variable is identifying the variable's unit of analysis. Recall that the unit of analysis tells us who the variable applies to, 
before, what, and when they existed. The unit of analysis should be the same unit of analysis from the conceptual definition. Using our democracy variable as an example, our unit of analysis from the conceptual definition was countries in the year 2017. The next step in establishing this is establishing the specific observable criteria for your variable. For example, if we were measuring democracy and we wanted to measure elections, we would specifically examine whether a country has free and fair elections, where every adult can participate and the rules do not favor one party over another. In addition, we will want to make sure leaders are held accountable. One observable and measurable way leaders are held accountable is having to face re-election at fixed intervals. The next step in creating an operational definition is identifying the values your variable will take and what those values mean. For example, with our democracy variable, we can make a rule that when we identify a country as democratic, meaning it has free and fair elections and leaders face re-election at fixed intervals, we can give it a value of 1 and all other countries will receive a value of 0. The last step in creating an operational definition is identifying your data sources. Your data sources tell you whether your subjects meet the specific observable I criteria in your variable. We can either use data we collected, which is called primary data, or use data that other people have collected, which is called secondary data. If we wanted to collect primary data, we could use information from news reports, government documents, surveys, or experiments. There are a lot of places we can collect data from. Of course, there are a ton of political science related data sets out there that other scholars have already created, so often it's just easier to use data other people have created instead of creating our own. So in our previous example, we stated that we would classify a country as democratic if it had free and fair elections where every adult could participate and the rules do not favor one party over the other. In addition, leaders in a country have to face re-election at fixed intervals. We could use the CIA World Factbook as a data source in this case to determine if different countries throughout the world meet those two criteria. The, var the variable we created would be a primary, primary source as we collected it. And here is the operational definition of democracy in full. After we develop our operational definition, we can then enter the data into a statistical software program. In this class, we will be using a program called SPSS to analyze our data. In SPSS, in the Data View tab, you can enter in the data for your data set. The first thing you should know is that the column headings should identify the variable names. Typically, the first couple of variables in your data set should identify your data set's unit of analysis. So in this data set, the subjects of the data set are countries, and the time is the year 2017. So we know the unit of analysis for this data set is countries in the year 2017. The subsequent column headings should be the names of the variables. So the first variable in this data set, substantive variable, is GDP per capita. Next, the rows are where you enter in the data for the individual observations. So for observation 5, the country is Luxembourg. The year is 2017, and the value for GDP per capita is $109,100. Now, for the most part in class, you will not be entering in your own data for your assignments. Instead, you will be working with data sets other people have created. Hence, you will have to know how to read data sets when you use them. So if you need to figure out how to read a data set and figure out its unit of analysis, you should use these basic rules. However, it is important to note that it might not be possible to follow all those rules when creating a data set and so the structure of data sets vary. For example, it is possible that while the type of subjects in a data set should remain constant, the time in which data are collected for those subjects might vary. 
For example, if we were to collect data on countries for GDP per capita and for the unemployment rate in those countries, we might not be able to collect data for both of those variables for the same year. While the subjects of the unit of analysis should be constant in the data set, but the timeline might not be, that means the unit of analysis for each variable in the data set might not be exactly the same. This is not an issue if you do not want the time frames to be the same, or if the data are from within a reasonable time frame, such as within 5 or 10 years of each other. Since there is variation in the structure of data sets, this makes it a bit difficult to figure out what a data set or a variable in a data set's unit of analysis is. As such, you can use these tips to help you figure it out. Sometimes the unit of analysis is implied from the data set name and not included as a variable in the data set. Sometimes the subjects, such as the who or the what, of the unit of analysis is included as a variable in the data set, but not the time frame. The data set name might have the time frame or the names of the variables might have the time frame. Sometimes the time frame of the unit of analysis is included as a variable in the data set, but not the subject who or what. The data set name should indicate what the subjects are. Here is an example of a data set where it is not clear exactly what the specific unit of analysis is for the data set. The subjects of the unit of analysis is not included as a variable name, but the name of the data set is states and all the data is from the United States, so it is acceptable to assume that the subject of the unit of analysis is the U.S. states. Also, there is no variable in the data set with the time frame in it. Instead, the variable names seem to have the years listed in them. So for the Obama 2012 variable, which measures Obama's vote share in a state, it is safe to assume that this data was from the 2012 election. Hence, the unit of analysis for this particular variable in this data set is the U.S. states in 2012. After we write our conceptual definitions and collect our data, we can classify what kind of data set we have. This classification will be based on your unit of analysis. Recall that the unit of analysis tells you who or what the variable applies to and when the who or what existed. Based on the unit of analysis, you can classify your data set as either a case study, cross-sectional, time series, or cross-sectional time series. This chart here can help you determine what kind of variable you have. If your variable only applies to one subject and you only have a few observations for that subject, then you have a case study. An example of this would be studying democracy in the United States in 2017. There would only be one subject, the U.S., with a couple of observations in 2017. If your variable only applies to one subject, but you have multiple observations for that subject, then you have a time series variable. An example of this would be studying democracy in the United States between 2001 and 2017. There would only be one subject in the United States with multiple observations between 2001 and 2017. If your variable applies to multiple subjects and you only have one observation per subject, then you have a cross-sectional variable. An example of this would be studying democracy in all countries throughout the world in 2017. There would be multiple subjects, all countries in the world, with one observation in 2017. If your variable applies to multiple subjects with multiple observations per subject, then you have a cross-sectional time series variable. An example of this would be studying democracy in all countries throughout the world between 2001 and 2017. There would be multiple subjects, all the countries in the world, with multiple observations between 2001 and 2017. Going back to our democracy variable, our unit of analysis was countries throughout the world in 2017. In our variable, we would have observations for multiple subjects, all countries in the world, with one observation in 2017. That would make us that would make our variable a cross-sectional variable.
In the first part of this lecture, I'm going to show you how to classify a variable based on the values the variable can take. You can classify a variable as nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio level. Remembering the word noir is an easy way to remember these four terms, as the letters in the word noir are the first letters of these four words. Noir means black in French. Nominal level variables divide the subjects or observations in your variable into different categories. The categories are exhaustive, meaning that you include all the possible categories. The categories are also mutually exclusive, meaning that you can only place a subject or observation in your data set into one of the categories. And note, while there is a numerical difference in categories, there is no inherent order in the data. One category is not greater than another. For example, if you were collecting data on voters' party identification, you had to have three different categories in your data. Republican, Democrat, and Independent. These categories are mostly exhaustive as they capture the three main party identifications in the United States. These categories are also mutually exclusive because a voter cannot be classified into two categories, such as a Republican and a Democrat. And even though these categories have different numerical values, there is no inherent order in the variable. Even though independents are given a 2, they are not greater than Democrats a 1 or Republicans a 0. Ordinal level variables also divide the subjects or observations in your variable into different categories. The categories are exhaustive, meaning that you include all the possible categories. The categories are also mutually exclusive, meaning that you can only place a subject or observation in your data set into one of the categories. In addition, there is inherent order with an ordinal level variable. For example, many survey, surveys ask respondents about the extent to which they support a candidate. The surveyors divide the support answers into numerical rank order categories, such as giving strongly oppose a negative 2, oppose a negative 1, neutral a 0, support a 1, and strongly support a 2. As you can see, the least support has the lowest value, negative 2, and as a respondent's support increases, the values go up by 1. However, Note that while there is inherent numerical order in this data, the spaces between the categories are not inherently fixed. A survey respondent might feel that there is a huge difference between strongly opposed and opposed, but a small difference between opposed and neutral. Interval level variables are ordered. The spaces between the categories are fixed. For example, the spaces between 1 and 2 equal the same distance between 2 and 3, one unit, but with interval level variables, there is no true zero. Ideology could be an interval level variable. You could have a continuous ideology variable that range from zero, extremely, li extremely liberal, to five, moderate, to 10, extremely conservative. But the zero in this case is an artificial zero. We could have moved the scale from negative five to five instead, and zero would become moderate and would not fundamentally change the nature of the variable. Note that because interval level variables have no true zero, we cannot use ratios or percentages with them. Since there is no true zero, it is just an arbitrary marker, there is no zero of something, so there can't be a percentage increase of something. To, to illustrate with the ideology variable, since there is no true zero in the variable, there is no zero of something in the measurement, so there cannot be a percentage increase in something in the variable. Last, ratio level variables are ordered, the spaces between the categories are fixed, and ratio level variables have a true zero. Military spending is a ratio level variable. Military spending ranges from zero to any positive value. And because there is a true zero, we can use ratios and percentages with the data. So for example, $2 of military spending is 100% more than $1 of military spending. Next, I'm going to show you how to use basic statistics to describe data. First, I will discuss measures of central tendency. Central tendency is just another way of saying the average or typical case of a variable. There are three measures of central tendency, the mode, median, and mean. The mode is the most common or most repeated value in the variable. In order to find the mode by hand, you arrange the values from the smallest to the largest, then you find the most repeated values in the data set. To demonstrate how to figure out what, which value of a variable has the largest number of observations, I will use common space scores from the 106th Congress. Common space scores measure House members' ideological position by using roll call votes. Common space scores range from negative 1 to 1, 
with values less than zero being liberal and values greater than zero being conserv conservative. In this particular example, I ordered the data from smallest to largest and I found two modes. There is a mode for Democrats, negative 0.374, and a mode for Republicans, 0.359. In both cases, there are six observations with the value of negative 0.374 and 0.359. There are no values in the data set where seven or more observations share the same value. The second measure of central tendency is the median. The median is the middlemost value of a variable. It cuts the variable in half with the lowest 50% of values on one side and the highest 50% of values on the upper side. To find the median by hand, you arrange your variable from the smallest to largest value. Then you find the median observation number. The position of the median when you have an odd number of observations is equal to the number of observations plus one and that value divided by two. In our common space score example, there were, 100, there were 437 observations. 437 plus one is 438. 438 divided by two is 219. The median observation number is 219. I have arranged the data from the smallest to the largest value. Observation 219 has a value of 0 0.137. So the median is 0 0.137. If the median house member has a common space score of 0 0.137, who do you think controlled the House of Representatives, Republicans or Democrats? It was Republicans. Recall that the common space scores greater than zero indicate a house member is conservative. The median tells us in this case that the average House member is conservative, indicating that Republicans control the House of Representatives. I showed you how to find the median for a variable with an odd number of observations. Now I'm going to show you how to find the median for a variable with an even number of observations. With an even number, the position of the median calculation will produce a number that will have a 0.5 as a decimal at the end. The median is the average of the values for observations below and above the position of the median number. So let's say we have a common space variable with 436 observations. We would run the same calculation as before. The position of the median when you have an odd number of observations is equal to the number of observations plus one and that value divided by two. We get a number with a 0.5 at the end. So what we do is we take the observation that is below this value and the observation that is above this value and find the average of those two observations. If we have 436 observations, our calculation would produce 218.5. So we should take the average of observations 218 and 219. Observation 218 had a value of 0.135. Observation 219 had a value of 0 0.137. The average of 0 0.135 and 0 0.137 is the sum of those two numbers divided by 2, or 0.136. The third measure of central tendency is the mean. The mean is the sum of a set of values divided by the total number of observations. Formally, the equation looks like this. x bar means the mean of x. Any variable name with a bar over it indicates that it is the mean of that variable. The Greek letter sigma capitalized means the sum of. In this case, it means the sum of all the observations in x. And n means the number of observations. For our common space score example, the mean of the common space scores are the sum of the common space scores divided by the total number of observations. I calculated this by hand. The sum of the common space scores was 21.788. The total number of observations was 437. 21.788 divided by 437 equals 0 0.05. The mean of the common space scores was 0 0.05. So in sum, there are three different measures of central tendency, the mode, median, and mean. And all three measures give us different values, as in the common space score example leading us to draw different conclusions about the average or typical case of a variable. 
So when do we use these three different measures? If we are examining a nominal level variable, we should only use the mode. Recall that the values of a nominal level variable have no order. The mode does not assume a variable has order, but the median and mean do assume a variable has order. Hence, with a nominal level variable, we only use the mode to describe the typical case of the variable. With an ordinal level variable, the values of the variable have order, but the spaces between values are not fixed. We can use the mode for an ordinal level variable because the mode simply tells us the most common value in the data. We can also use the median because we can order the data from smallest to largest and find the middlemost value. We can also use the mean, but it is debatable whether it makes sense to use the mean for an ordinal level variable. The mean assumes that the spaces between the values of a variable are fixed, which is not always the case with an ordinal level variable. Nevertheless, social scientists often use the mean to describe an ordinal level variable. Next, recall that interval and racial level variables are ordered and continuous. Hence, we can either use the mean, median, or mode to describe the typical value of, of these types of variables. Frequency distributions, bar graphs, and histograms tell us whether most observations of a variable have values that are close to the mean, median, or mode, or spread out away from the mean, median, or mode. A frequency distribution is a table that summarizes the distribution of a variable's values. It tells us how many observations each value take. It is mostly used for analyze the, analyzing the distributions of nominal and ordinal level variables. As an example on how to build a frequency distribution, I will use hypothetical Polity 4 data. Polity 4 measures the openness of democratic institutions. Polity 4 classifies countries as autocratic, onocratic, or democratic. This is a hypothetical data set of 10 countries. Each country's Polity 4 classification is indicated in the column here. As you can see, there are three democracies, there are five onocracies, and there are two autocracies. We will use this information to build a frequency distribution. Here is the frequency distribution. In the first column, you write categories as the column title. Then you write the categories underneath it and add the word total to the bottom. The categories should be written in some sort of logical order if possible. In the second column, you write F as the column title. Then you write the number of observations in each category and add the total number of observations at the bottom. Here's the frequency distribution example with the polity data. In the first column, you write categories as the column title, then you write the categories underneath it, autocracy, anocracy, and democracy, and add the word total at the bottom. The categories should be written in some sort of logical order. So in this case, I wrote the categories from the least free countries, autocracies, to the most free countries, democracies. In the second column, you write the letter F as the column title. Then you write the number of observations in each category and add the total number of observations at the bottom. As you can see, there are two autocracies, five anocracies, and three democracies. for a total of 10 observations, which you write at the bottom here. You can also add two additional columns to your frequency distribution. The first is the category percentage column. It tells you the percentage of cases each category takes in the data set. It is calculated by dividing the total number of observations in one category by the total number of observations overall and multiplying that value by 100. Going back to our frequency distribution example, the category percentage for autocracy would be 2 divided by 10 and that number multiplied by 100, which is 20%. The category percentage for anocracy would be 5 divided by 10 and that number multiplied by 100, or 50% and the category percentage for democracy would be 3 divided by 10 and that number times third times 100 or 30%
Here we add a column with a category percentage title, and then we add 20%, 50%, and 30% to the appropriate rows. All of these values should add up to 100%. The last column we add to the frequency distribution is the cumulative percentage. The cumulative percentage tells us the percentage of observations at and below a given value. Note this assumes there is order in the data, so this is mostly for ordinal interval and ratio level variables. So the cumulative percentage for a category is a sum, is the sum of category percentage for that category and all the category percentages in the categories below it. So for example, the autocracy category is the first category, so it only has a cumulative percentage of its own category, 20%. The cumulative percentage value for anocracies would be the sum of the category percentage for anocracies and autocracies. So it would be 20% plus 50%, which is 70%. The cumulative percentage value for democracies would be the sum of the category percentages for autocracies, anocracies, and democracies. So it would be 20% plus 50% plus 30%, which equals 100%. We add this information to the last column. We write cumulative percentage as the column title and add 20%, 70%, and 100% to the appropriate rows. Note that we leave the total row empty for the cumulative percentage column. In the next part of the lecture, I will show you how to make a bar graph. A bar graph is a visual representation of the data from a frequency distribution. As such, it is best used for nominal and ordinal level variables. When you construct a bar graph, you place the total number of cases or percentage of cases on the y-axis and the category names on the x-axis. This is a bar graph that rep represents the information from the poly 4 frequency distribution example. As you can see, the percentage of cases is on the y-axis and the category names are on the x-axis. Note that I place a variable name below the x-axis as well. 20% of cases were autocracies, 50% were onocracies, and 30% were democracies. So to interpret this graph, we would say 20% of the cases were autocracies, 50% were onocracies, and 30% were democracies. Now I'm going to briefly describe how histograms are constructed. A histogram is just a special kind of bar graph for interval and ratio level variables. If we made a bar graph out of an interval or ratio level variable, then we'd have to put a category in the x-axis for every single value of the variable, which would be a lot of categories. With so many categories on the x-axis, the graph wouldn't be visually appealing or informative. So instead, we create categories or bins on the x-axis that represent a range of values for the variable and then we count to see how many observations have values that fit within the range of values for each category. Hence, the bars represent the total number of or percentage of observations in the variable that fit within the range of values for each category. Here's an example of a histogram for the common space scores from the House in the 106th Congress. Recall from the beginning of the lecture that common space scores measure Congress members' ideological leanings on a negative one-to-one -one scale based on their voting behavior. As you can see on the x-axis, these bars do not represent specific values in the variable. They represent ranges of values. This makes the graph more informative and visually appealing. If there was a bar for each common space value, the graph would look very cluttered, messy, and hard to interpret. So what does this histogram tell us about the typical member of Congress? We could say something like, there was not one typical House member in the 106th Congress. Instead, there were two typical House members in Congress, a liberal Democrat here and a conservative Republican about here. Democrats and Republicans in Congress have different ideological preferences based on their voting behavior. Now I'm going to show you how to describe a bar graph or histogram for ordinal interval and ratio level variables using the following char characteristics, center and spread, number of peaks or modes, and skewness. 
The center of a bar graph or histogram is where the median is located. You can calculate this by hand or use SPSS to do it, which you will learn how to do in the next lab video. The simplest way to calculate the spread of a bar graph or histogram is to take the value of the largest observation value and subtract the value of the smallest observation value from it. For example, in this bar graph, the center or median is 50, and the spread is 90 the largest value minus 10 the smallest value, which is 80. The next characteristic of a bar graph or histogram that you should describe is the number of peaks. You should note where they are and how many they are. If there's only one clear peak, the graph is unimodal. If there are two clear peaks, the graph is bimodal. If there are many clear peaks, the graph is multimodal. And if there's more than one clear peak, note if the peaks are about the same size or if some are bigger than the others. Also note, as this is a bit confusing, that calculating the mode by hand is different than identifying the mode or modes in a graph. Here is an example of a graph that is unimodal with one mode at 50. Here is an example of a bar graph that is bimodal with one mode at zero and the other mode at 100. The peaks are about the same size. Here is an example of a bar graph that is bimodal with one mode at zero and the other mode at 100. The zero peak is larger than the 100 peak. The next characteristic of a bar graph or histogram that you have to describe is skewness. If a bar graph or histogram has a negative skew, the left side of the graph extends much further than the right side of the graph. If it has a positive skew, the right side of the graph extends much further than the left side of the graph. If there is no skew, the left and right sides of the graph extend about the same amount from the center of the graph. This is an example of a bar graph with a negative skew, as the left side of the graph extends much further than the right side of the graph. This is an example of a bar graph with a positive skew, as the right side of the graph extends much further than the left side of the graph. This is an example of a bar graph with no skew as the left or right sides of the graph extend about the same from the center of the graph. In the next slide slides, I'm going to give you examples of how to use center spread, modality, and skewness to describe bar graphs and histograms. In this graph, the center is 50, which I calculated by hand, but you could use SPSS to do it. The spread is 90, the largest value, minus 10, the smallest value, which equals 80. The graph is unimodal with one mode of 50, and there is no skew as the left or right sides of the graph extend about the same amount from the center of the graph. In this graph, the center is 50. The spread is 100, the largest value, minus 0, the smallest value, which equals 100. The graph is bimodal, which one mode at 0 and one mode at 100. The peaks are even and there is no skew as the left and right sides of the graph extend about the same amount from the center of the graph. In this graph, the center is 50. The spread is 100, the largest value, minus 0, the smallest value, which equals 100. The graph is bimodal, with one mode at 0 and the other mode at 100. The peaks are not even. The zero peak is larger than the, is the larger mode. And there is no skew as the left and right sides of the graph extend about the same amount from the center of the graph. In this graph, the center is 50, the spread is 70, the largest value, minus negative 10, the smallest value, which equals 80. The graph is unimodal with one mode at 50. In this graph, there is a negative skew as the left side of the graph extends much further than the right side of the graph. In this graph, the center is 20, the spread is 70, the largest value, minus 10, the smallest value, which equals 60. The graph is unimodal with one mode at 10. In this graph, there is a positive skew as the right side of the graph extends much further than the left side of the graph. Now I'm going to teach you an additional way to describe the distribution of a variable, the variance and standard deviation. Consider these two histograms of two different variables. Each variable has the same mean, 50, and each variable has the same spread, 100 minus 0, which is 100, and each graph has one peak. There are unimodal around 50, and each one has no skew. Yet, the variables still look distributed in different ways. If you examine the variable on the left, the distribution is more peaked around the mean of 50, meaning many observations take values that are close to 50. But with the variable on the right, the distribution is more flat.
with many observations taking values that are far away from 50. On the left, we would say there's very little variance, and on the right, we would say there is a lot of variance. We can calculate two numerical values that tell us by how much a variable's observations deviate from its mean on average. Those values are called variance and standard deviation. I will show you how to calculate them. First, the sample variance, denoted by an S squared, is the sum of each observation minus the sample mean squared and that value divided by the total number of observations minus one. Second, the sample standard deviation, denoted by the letter S, is the square root of the sample variance. In order to show you how to calculate the sample variance and sample standard deviation, I will use a variable called percent living below $2 per day. There will be 10 observations from less developed countries. In order to calculate the sample variance, we start by taking the sample mean of your data. Recall that the mean is just the average of all the cases. So let's say we collected data on the percent of people living under $2 a day in 10 countries. The overall mean of this data was 29.4. Then you subtract the mean, in this case 29.4, from each observation. So for country one, you calculate 46.1 minus 29.4, which equals 16.7. For country two, you calculate 60.4 minus 29.4, which equals 31. And you continue this process for each observation. Note that all we are doing right now is calculating how far each individual observation deviates from the mean of 29.4. Next, you take the values from step two and square them. So the calculation for the first observation would be 16.7 squared, which equals 278.9. And the calculation for the second observation would be 31 squared or 961. And you continue this process for each observation. Note that we square the values to get rid of negative deviations. It is impossible for an observation to negatively deviate from its mean. Next, you add all the values from step three together. In this case, the value was 5,840.4. Then you take the value from step four and divide it by the number of observations minus one. In this case, the number of observations was 10, so 10 minus one is nine. So the calculation is 5,840.4 divided by 9, which equals 648.9. So the variance for the percent living under $2 a day sample is 648.9. Note that all we are doing here is calculating the average deviation from the mean. We added all the deviations together and divided by the total number number of observations minus one, which is almost like calculating an average. Last, you take the square root of the variance to find the sample standard deviation. We take the square root because we squared the values in step three. As a result, the values of the variable became much larger. So you wanna take the square root to bring the number back to a more realistic level. In this case, the square root of 648.9 is 25.5. So our sample standard deviation for percent living under $2 a day is 25.5. Now we can interpret the mean and standard deviation. To interpret, you should start by stating the mean of the variable. Then you would say, in our sample, observations deviated about standard deviation units from the mean on average. So applying this to our example, we would say, on average, 29.4% of people in less developed countries live below $2 a day. However, in our sample, observations varied about 25.5% from the mean on average. Note that I only use these percentage signs because the variable is measured in percentages. Use whichever units the variable is measured in. 